murina te na koe te paia te na koe te te na koe te te kai fakarite i na karaki ai te ata nei hoia no tai no atu ki te wai o wai te mata e pia ta ata mai nei waho me na finua e takoto mai nei i te nei wata tau kaina na mihi ra ki a tatau Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here to speak at your conference. Understand it's the last day, so uh, hopefully I won't uh, bore you too much as we go through the, the next hour. So I'll jump straight into it. The, as Tepaya has said, this framework largely came out of my, uh, a culmination of my work as a secondary school teacher as I was leading into uh, doctoral studies. And one of the difficulties we had at that time was coming up with a particular framework that I could hang my argument on. And also within that framework is trying to sort of, I guess, a wee bit of how I think, distill things down into a sort of diagrammatic form to help uh, declutter the many things that were sort of moving around in my head at times. So in the next 40-odd uh, minutes, I'm going to run through a, a series of terms if you have there. Some of them are familiar, uh, and some of them may be my particular interpretation or my particular slant to them. And kaupapa Māori is the theoretical tool that a lot of my uh, discussion this morning is, is going to pivot around. And then running through contextual knowledge, decontextual, mātauranga Māori, Mātauranga iwi, tūranga waiwai, uh, whakapapa Māori and ranga are the key terms that I'll go through as we uh, work our way forward. And again, just to, to make the statement, kaupapa Māori theory is simply a, uh, a space saver. It's to ensure the elements out of uh, non-Māori or non-indigenous ways of thinking do not uh, subsume, do not assimilate the thinking that is from an indigenous space and place. It is not a knowledge system. It's not simply created to antagonize Western theories. Uh, what it is, it's simply to allow those of you who are beginning your theoretical uh, pieces of work to pick from the academy of tools that lay out there. At times, as we're, we're looking for theoretical arguments to support what we're, trying to, uh, what we're trying to present, not many of the tools that exist would fully support your argument. Me coming from a, a particular Māori point of view, the many tools that were, that were and still exist out there, while parts of it would support the argument, there would be other parts that would contradict the argument. So kaupapa Māori theory allowed us the opportunity to simply lay those tools out, pick the elements that are relevant and that work for the particular issues that we're working with, and leave the other parts there. Also, at times, it created the opportunity to create a new set of tools. As we're beginning to engage and move in things that the, the academy, the theories that exist, were not quite ready or in, were able to to address the concerns we're working with. So it allowed us to build a new set of tools, largely around the issues that we're dealing with from a Māori or from an indigenous uh, perspective. So in a, in a nutshell, that's, that's largely my interpretation of kaupapa Māori. And I'll come back to this uh, later as we go through the presentation. Again, mātauranga Māori, it's simply Māori knowledge. It hosts the core values and principles that apply to all Māori. And I'll expand on that uh, shortly. Mātauranga a iwi uh, may not be a, a, as commonly known term as mātauranga Māori. The word mātauranga is knowledge. And in this instance, mātauranga a iwi refers to the notion that Māori are not a homogenous grouping of people. We're made up of tribal uh, identities. In essence, there are multiple world views that exist in the term Māori. And mātauranga a iwi simply is drawing the relationship between the tribal elements that exist and each tribe has its own particular set of knowledge that links and relates to their particular tribe. So while mātauranga Māori 
hosts the values, the application of those values is what's located here in Matauranga Aiwi. And I'll, again, as I go through into the diagram, I'll talk more on that shortly. The term whakapapa is the term that has largely been used to describe genealogy. However, if I, a lot of my work goes back to finding the, bait, the base, the root form of, of some of these terms, which provide the insight into some of the, the, the epistemological elements that sit in there. So whakapapa comes from the term raupapa, which simply means to lay things out in the sequential order of events that created them. So whatever it is you're looking at, whether you're looking at elements of time, whether you want to look at it from second to second, from minute to minute, from day to day, week to week, month to month, and so forth, whatever those elements are that you are measuring are the elements that you lay out in the order of events that created them. So within a particular perspective from Tuhoi or a particular perspective from Māori, every single element we have in our worldview has a sequential order of events. And the key part is how we're actually able to link into those key points, those key reference points, those key points which provide the rationale and the explanation and the intent that sits behind a lot of our practices. And for my particular argument here, I'm within reference here, is knowledge. Knowledge within Te Ao Māori has a sequential order of events that created it and that map the changes and the evolution of where it is today. So we're not locked in a particular space and time. To be Māori is not to be the locked into a particular paradigm of being the cultural performance element and then from there you then hold them to one side and then you get on with the core business of what you're, what you're engaging in. So it's to lay the argument that, that there is a sequential range of events that have occurred along the way from where we have come from to where we are at the moment and always in that very evolutionary stage things are going to continue to develop and change. And the key point here, change is not, an, is not the enemy. The enemy is if we change without realising the reference points and the basis as to where these things have come from. The next point is around the term Māori. And again, this term is, if, if you open up a Williams Dictionary or a Nata Dictionary or a P.M. Ryan Dictionary or the many, many dictionaries, I, and I believe there's even some online now, you'll find that... Uh, this term largely has been translated as life force, energy, uh, and, and it is those things. But again, using my particular lens, if you look at the word, it's a compound word. Ma, M-A, is just simply a, a sentence uh, starter, and Uri is related. So the makeup of this word, it is reminding us, and it's giving us the clue and the evidence of its meaning, and it reminds us to be related. If we look at whakapapa, whakapapa just simply lays those elements that we're measuring in the sequential order of events. They do not exist mutually exclusive of each other. Within Te Ao Māori, you'll hear people often respond to the fact that we, our world is a holistic worldview where you cannot pull one element out in isolation and look at it. It's got to be explained within its context, how it relates to what's before, what's after, what's above and what's below. So Māori here is that key element that ensures these elements that we're looking at within Whakapapa do relate to each other. They do not exist mutually exclusive to each other. And in drawing out the relationship between elements, it also sets out a set of responsibilities that one has to the other. There is a relationship, that relationship requires a set of responsibilities that each have of each other. Now, the use of the, the term ranga is, is deliberate. And uh, although my, my diagram is a bit poor, it, it should try and show that. So just starting from the top, running left to right, is the term generic knowledge. And again, it's the, the term I wrestled with was Pākehā knowledge, although I was instructed that not quite the correct term to use in the sense that it's knowledge that does not come from, indi from an indigenous space or place, or knowledge that does not come from a Māori or Tūhoe space and place. So 
So it just simply exists. Also, uh, operating in the the, hor uh, the, the horizontal, Matauranga Māori, again, it exists. As I said, it hosts the core values uh, that every single person within Te Ao Māori engage in. Matauranga Māori, as I alluded to earlier, holds the core values and the principles. These two elements I've presented in my framework here as decontextual knowledge. It's knowledge that does not have a context. And through my uh, studies and, and the, the different times I've, I've talked about different elements in here, people have challenged me around the notion that every single thing has a context. And when we look at generic knowledge, if I were to pick a, a term out of the English language, you will often find the root base of that term is either Latin, Greek, French. It has context, plural. And as we begin to develop and evolve the language, the contexts that these terms have come from often become a wee bit disconnected and become a wee bit confused from the terms. Similar argument within Matauranga Māori, but however in this sense, the application of the principles that exist there do not reside there. For argument's sake, we're in, uh, we're in a particular uh, territory where we've got, uh, we've got Nazi Fatua, we've got elements of Tainui uh, sitting here within in this particular territory we're in. And the example I use, if we take the concept pohiri, now the, the term principle or value may not be the, the, cri, uh, the, the correct term, but the intent sits there. So if you've gone through the pohiri process here, you ask a question, why was this particular thing done during the pohiri process? The answer you will be given is not a Māori answer. The answer you will be giving, you will be given, is as it relates to Ngāti Whātua, whether it or Tainui, or Ngāpuhi. So those are the elements that sit within there. Now, I mean, it's, it's relatively common sense, but given that we're um, talking to, a, to a, a group of people in libraries where some of the work that we have to do within the old Māori space is we have to rewrite our histories. And that's R-I-G-H-T as well as W-R-I-T-E. We have to rewrite the histories that have been written about us. And in using this simple argument is one of the key elements that was the way the majority of the early recordings of Te Māori were created in. And the prime example is is Governor Gray, his, uh, the myths and legends of Māori, is where he took key elements out of the different tribal stories that he was hearing around the place. Some of the terms were, were familiar, some of the concepts were familiar. However, he took a group of stories, merged them together, and then merging them together, confused them, disconnected them from the actual true audiences they were intended for, and they now became a confused set of stories that were written about Te Ao Māori. And in the sense, they were presented as myth and legend, and in doing so, removed some of the deep epistemological stories and ideologies that exist within an indigenous time frame, and simply packaged them as stories to entertain children. So in doing that, there was a shift in balance as to what was true knowledge and what was not. So again, Making the point here, Matauranga Māori hosts those core values. The application lay elsewhere. So if I were to arrive as a researcher, I analyse and I document the pōhiri process as it has been undertaken by Ngāti Whātua. I then print the informed document on pōhiri, and then that then sits in libraries around the country, around the world, as the definitive statement on pōhiri. And if I happen to come from Tainui, and I do pōhiri differently than as a researcher, I have a problem. Because I have to present my argument, my truth from a Tainui perspective, and in doing so, having to disprove what is in fact true for Ngāti Whātua. And in doing so, we then begin to, as uh, Friere has, has mentioned, if we're not careful, 
if we begin to ape the oppressor, then we're in an ever-decreasing spiral downwards. So again, it's making the point, if we're not careful, these elements that are written and that are generically applied to Māori could unwittingly begin to homogenise us and then infiltrate and then begin to roll out the elements of hegemony of which we are fighting against within the educational context that we exist in. So, these two terms exist in a decontextual state. Vertically, we've got mātauranga a iwi, and again, tribal knowledge, it's where the application to the principles that occur in mātauranga Māori exist. I'm not saying mātauranga Māori needs to be uh, subsumed by mātauranga aiwi, no. I'm just simply saying is that mātauranga Māori is that generic space where the application, sorry, where the values and the principles exist, the application then exists in a tribal context. And then I present this argument here as contextual knowledge. It's contextual in the sense using whakapapa, using the sequential order of events that created the knowledge, if we trace for my particular tribe the philosophies, our epistemology, our understanding of our environment, our world views, it's informed by the relationship we have with Te Urewera and the people of Tsuhoi who engage with it. So if we peel things back to its simple sense, and again through my uh, indigenous or my, my Tuhoi knowledge forms, there are 42 generations from me back to Rangi and Papa, 40 back to Tane, who then through his work that he has done in the worldview of, of Māori and indigenous, created the forest, and in doing so, creating the forest, there was a genealogy of the trees and the plants, the flora and the fauna that exist there. So I am able to locate myself into that context through genealogy, I'm able to locate where I fit, and through whakapapa and Māori, I'm able to understand what my relationship is to them, my responsibility to them, as, i.e. the environment, and what the responsibility of that environment is to me. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that shortly. So mātauranga aiwi, in this sense, is contextual knowledge. Separating generic knowledge and mātauranga Māori, I have deliberately placed the term kaupapa Māori, or kaupapa Māori theory, and similarly between mātauranga a iwi and mātauranga Māori. If I just touch on the, the, the gap between generic knowledge and mātauranga Māori first, as I said, kaupapa Māori is a space saver. In this sense, what it's doing it's ensuring that the generic knowledge strand does not subsume mātauranga Māori. And by simply through assimilation or by simply existing, by default it just subsumes what is there. Another way of interpreting my use of kaupapa Māori, uh, I guess a good many of us in, in the room here, when we were educated through our formal education system within the New Zealand context, it built, crafted a set of lens for us to view our world. Those lens were built on a set of values and principles that exist in that generic knowledge strand. Absolutely, perfectly fine, wonderful for that particular environment. Where it becomes problematic is when we take those lens, built on the values and principles for generic knowledge, and we then use them to try and understand what is happening in Matauranga Māori. So we're trying to understand another world view built on another set of values and principles. And then we unwittingly begin to make value statements. We begin to measure them on the values and principles from another space and place. And then we then begin to form and create judgments. So my interpretation of kaupapa Māori, as we move from generic knowledge to mātauranga Māori, there's a reconscientization needs to occur. And the reconscientization simply means as we leave that generic knowledge strand, we remove the spectacles, the lens that were created for that world, which operate perfectly fine for that world. And the reconscientization occurs as we begin to craft a new set of spectacles, a new set of lens to understand that Māori worldview. 
And in doing so, we see the term Māori is problematic. Because for those of us who engage in it all the time, we move through it seamlessly. At times, people aren't too sure whether we're talking as generically as Māori, or as we are talking as our own tribal identity informs us. Every Māori person will start from their tribal identity. And it will normally go along the lines, this is my maunga, this is my awa, this is my marae, this is my territory, this is my waka. Geographically and cognitively, they are locating themselves to a particular point in space and time where they, through their whakapapa, their sequential order of events, have helped inform their thinking to where they are today. So again, kaupapa Māori theory, the reconscientization occurs, remove the spectacles out of the generic knowledge form, leave them there, you craft and create a new set of lens which enable you to see the multiple layers and the multiple world realities that exist in the word Māori and in the term iwi. I also have it separating mātauranga a iwi and mātauranga Māori. And reflecting back on my, my own upbringing from a very tribally centric viewpoint, as I engaged out of my tribally cent centric view, it was being aware that there are other world views out there. So I was not to bring what was my truth for Tuhoe and to apply it over Ngāti Whātua or Te Arawa or whoever. It was simply to understand as we move into their particular worlds, their particular environments, there are a new set of processes that we must, or new set of applications we must understand. And for many of you who have been on to Pōhiri and many different marae, you will see at some point in time there will be a conversation around uh, what are the processes of this marae? Is it tautūtu? Is it paike? In essence, what are they speaking? Is it all manuhiri? Or is it all tangata whenua first, then manuhiri? Or is it one for one? These are the elements that begin to, to inform as we then go through the formal processes of engaging and entering onto their particular spaces and places under their interpretation of pōhiri. And lastly, as I said, mātauranga āiwi is contextual in the sense that it is fixed into a particular environment, it's fixed into a particular rohe, and it describes the relationship between the people and their landscape and their environment, and the practices that then occur as a result of that help inform, in my view, what is mātauranga āiwi. Here are a couple of examples of mātauranga āiwi. The, the term ngahere is the term that's been used to describe the forest. Uh, later years there have been transliteral words, but in essence if we go back, ngahere o ngaherehere. Again, it's a compound word. Ngā, N-G-A, simply means plural. Here is connections. So... Implicit in the meaning of the word is a reminder that we have a multiple set of connections to that environment. This tree, largely familiar to most of us, uh, kauri, again, it's a compound word. The ka, ka, is a particle or sentence starter. Uri, relation. Again, the deliberate naming of that tree is reminding us that we have a relationship to each other. We are related. And in that relationship, it spells out the set of responsibilities we have to each other. Pirita, uh, which is a supaljack vine, again, the name in itself describes the action of this particular vine. It will grow from one particular point the, the vine, as it spreads, it wraps around the next tree next to that, then it spreads to the next one, wraps around, takes hold, grows there, and it continues to just spread itself out like a web. But in doing so, what it is doing, it, it is pulling all of these elements together. Hence what the name of the word uh, explains, piri, pull, ta, together. It pulls them together, and in doing so, it reminds us as people we do not exist mutually exclusive of each other. 
We have to have a relationship with each other. There has to be a set of responsibilities which defines how we relate and engage with each other. So again, through the ngahire, the deliberate naming of that particular realm, reminding us there are a set of relationships that we need to be mindful of, coming down through some of those the, the trees that exist there, kauri, again, the reminder that we're related down through to pirita, reminding that there is a connection that we must have. And again, if we trace through our genealogies, as I said, there's 41 generations uh, back to Tane. Each of these trees have their own particular whakapapa, their own particular genealogy. And it's through understanding those genealogies we're able to connect with distant relatives. And in that sense, the relationship takes on a slight different slant. We're not talking about a part of our environment, uh, again, which is some of the issues we're having at the moment around the, the aerial dumping of 1080 into these, into these areas. There is a relationship that exists there that part of our responsibility is to ensure that they are treated well, that we don't unwittingly damage the environment. Their, envi their relationship and responsibility to us from a science point of view, if we go through the photosynthesis process, is to create clean oxygen for us to operate and engage in within this world. So by understanding the relationships that we have with each other, it helps map our processes, our practices, and our tribal knowledge, our mātauranga aiwi that exists there. This particular uh, fungus is just the one on this side here, is it in its undried form, is a pukutawai. It grows on the beech tree, it's a, a fungus that grows up in the branches. It absorbs the sap and the water out of the tree until it gets to a, a particular weight where the branches are, are no longer able to support it, and then it uh, drops with a bit of a thud to the ground. Where it's harvested, simply collected and dried. And when it's dried, as you can see just uh, on this side here, has the consistency that's pretty close to polystyrene. It's very light. Uh, yeah, very light, very, very similar to polystyrene. The puku tawai, which is what this fungus is called, was used in when the communities were living from home to home. And they would move from particular settlement to settlement largely dependent on the availa availability of foods, weather conditions. As they would move from one settlement to the other, the fire that would be lit in that particular settlement was left burning the entire period the family uh, or the community were living in that uh, particular settlement. And it created a whole set of literacy around fire, uh, where uh, some of the, the best ways of keeping a fire going conservatively, so you don't, uh, you don't consume all of your, your resource in firewood, is that there were language and literacy around te tāmo te ahi, te kōmo te ahi, and simply how these fires were, were at night, the embers were put on top, so the fire would actually die down. In the morning, they just simply remove the ash from the top, and the embers are still glowing in the bottom, put kindling on, and then the fire starts for the next day's uh, cooking. So that fire would burn for the, entol the entire season the family were living in that particular settlement. As they would prepare to move to the next settlement, an ember out of that fire would be taken, placed into this particular fungus, which was buried probably a metre, metre and a half in the ground. A hole is dug, the fungus is placed down into the hole. The glowing red hot ember from the fire will be placed into the pukutawai, where it would melt. It would melt and it would be countersunk down into the fungus. And as it got down to a particular point where when you buried it, it wouldn't smother the ember, the ember sort of nestled itself in the middle of the fungus, this particular fungus would be buried. Buried, blocking off the uh, airflow to it, in essence suffocating it. The family would go away, six months, nine months, 12 months, when they would return to this particular community, they would go back, they would unearth it, pull it out from the air, put it into the fireplace where they want to light the fire, and as the oxygen then hits it again, it would begin to smolder again. So the kindling will be put onto that particular fungus, 
and then that would start the fire for that particular time period the community were living in that settlement. So the fire that was started from the previous year would use to light the fire for this year, and in sense is where, from my particular tribe, we use the word ahika to describe our connection to our particular landscape. Ahi, fire, ka, burning fire. So again, the fire that started, the previous season's fire, an ember would have been taken to start this year's fire, so there's a connection again through the whakapapa, the sequential order of events, that would link each of those elements to help and inform the present, and it would light the fire that will go for that particular season. Another example here, again, just using some of the language we have. Uh, again, apologies for my uh, my diagram. That's supposed to be a uh, a fare nui with uh, the sky above it. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> um, so if you if you bear with my limited drawing for the time being. Um, what we've got here is if we have a look uh, through the door there and the key parts, you've got a door there and this pole here and the hole in the top. So just in a, a very quick thumbnail sketch within, the, within a, a very, very heavily summarised and redacted world view of Te Ao Māori was you had 70 old children living between Rangi and Papa. Uru Te Ngāngara was the eldest. Uh, and the youngest was uh, Uenuku, or oh, some versions he, he was a, uh, a baby, other versions he was still in his mother's, uh, hadn't been born yet. So depending on which version you take, there were 71, 72 children that were living in a close embrace. Discussions then began how they would create space for them to, to operate in. So out of there we get uh, Uru Te Ngangara, who was the oldest, who then assumed the role as the oldest, any action or any uh, plan needed to be led by them. The other part, uh, again, largely was led by Tane, who was one of the younger children, uh, who sat and watched and considered, and then after some time decide, decided his particular approach which was separating the parents, because at this particular time, the key, the key terms or the key names in this particular version were uh, Tu Matawinga, who simply wanted his parents killed, Tafiri wanted the status quo to remain, and Tane, watching this debate polarise, knew uh, there was a you couldn't do either of those arguments. He came up with a compromise of separating the parents but keeping them in contact with each other. So therefore we get the point where as Tane reversed himself upside down, back against uh, Papa Tuanuku, feet pushing up and separated Ranginui. And the key point was he put Pau out into the, to hold Ranginui up in the air. And again, if you interpret that through a particular Māori set of lens, the Pau he put up were trees. The element that he was pushing up into the sky, it was the ozone layer, it was the oxygen area, again, which is generated through the photosynthesis process. So just a different way of explaining a world view. So at that particular time, with Ranginui being moved, it was the first time they could physically stand tall. So as the name of the world that we exist in today, it's called Te Ao Tūrua, Te Ao World Standing Tall. So until that time, we could... Uh, after, sorry, after the, the fact of separating them was where they could stand tall. So after the world had been created, then again one of the, the terms within the old Māori that has been poorly translated is uh, you will hear reference at times to 12 heavens or 10 heavens and the best translation to describe them is that they are, they are levels of consciousness. There are 12 levels of consciousness or there are 10 levels of consciousness uh, that exists. At the utmost of those levels, whether it's 10 or 12, was where the creator within our particular epistemologies resided, uh, Iwo Matuakore. And sitting there was the knowledge that were used to create the environment and the world view. So he sent word for someone from the 70 odd children to ascend to acquire the baskets of knowledge, Nākete Toru, from him. So again, the argument held by Fido, 
because they were the oldest, it needed to be done by, by them. Sitting and deliberating, uh, the, the, the outcome again was Tane, who was supported by Tafiri Matia, one of the older of the siblings, decided they would uh, make their particular pathway. And, sorry, and in selecting the pathway, the first thing Tane uh, contemplated on was no good securing Nakete Toru or the knowledge from the creator that was used to create the environment if there is no place to house them. So with the help of his, uh, his older sibling, Tafiri Matea, they ventured on to uh, Rangi Nui Tamaku Nui, which is a level of consciousness just above our particular world, Te Aoturua. And there he brought the prototype of what he saw of the first house, which interestingly was called Farekura, House of Learning. So he brought the prototype back down to this particular realm, and in doing so, he created a link that linked every realm now to the 12 or the 10 layers of consciousness. So the pathway Tane took, enter through the house, he'd climb up the Pautoko Manoa, and this hole here was simply a hole to let the smoke out of the old, uh, the old Wharenui, uh, where the fire was usually built about here, earth floor, and then the smoke would just sort of come at, the, it was just to one side of that tahuhu, that ridge pole. So Tane climbed through the door, up the Pautoko Manoa, and out that thing there which is called the Pumotomoto. As he emerged out, he was emerging onto Rangi Nui Tamaka Nui, and then he would begin the process of walking through the Whare Nui there, going up the Pautoko Manoa, emerging out, until he arrived at Te Toyongarangi, which is the twelfth layer. Excuse me. And at the twelfth layer was where he received Nakete o Te Wananga, and then again descended back down through the Pautoko Manoa, through the Pumotomoto, down the Pautoko Manoa, out the door and then down onto this particular layer. So the key thing is the knowledge arrived and was delivered to Te Aotearoa through the Pū Motomoto. And again, oh thanks Tupai. And again, the key point here is the link with our language. When our children are born, the fontanelle cap that's on their head is called Pū Motomoto. And again, it's in, re in recognition to that is the pathway, that is the vehicle of where knowledge comes down through our children, it's through that particular pathway. So as the knowledge comes from the other layers of consciousness down to this particular layer is where the pathway comes down through here. And again, some of the practices and some of the languages, are so, sorry, some of the terms and the processes we have within our language link and support the notion of other world views. Now, Judging around the room, I, I guess there are, are quite a few mums in, in the room and dads in the room and would remember back to when, <laughs> when you were pregnant, you have a particular craving for a particular food. Uh, as you go through uh, pregnancy, I remember the, the many cravings my wife had. Uh, the term we use for that particular uh, concept is kumamaha. So kumamaha is that you, the craving you have is largely drawn from your baby that's inside you that is storing its food for a journey it is about to embark on. So what it's doing is it's, it's, it's I guess it's filling up its lunchbox for its, uh, its trip it's about to go on. The interesting thing is, as those of us who have unfortunately had to look after our, our, uh, our ailing uh, parents or relatives, the similar concept again is there there is a particular craving they have before they pass. And again, the term there is kumamaha. And again, it is because as the pathway and as the journey you took before you were born, they are filling their lunchbox for the next journey they're about to embark on. And again, it's through that process of moving as we move between the worlds that exist around us. Coming down into our whare nui, and again that uh, pū motomoto was largely just to one side of the, the tāhuhu here. Again, if we have a look at the tāhuhu in most of our whare nui, that ridge pole, you will see there is no beginning and there's no end. It's simply to remind us we are here for a particular point in time. There was a time before us, and there's a time after us. And it just simply reminds us the context that we live in. And just to the, the side of the tahuhu, 
is a picture of a atypical popo which lined the side of the house. Now, if you were to look at this particular popo, you would think the artist uh, didn't quite get their dimensions right because if you were to follow the line of the mouth, the mouth needs to come out about here a bit more. Uh, so it's, it's almost he chopped the side of the mouth off. And again, what it's there is, remember, these things are stationed around the wall of the house. And it's deliberate in the sense that it is looking at us through a window from another world view. And what we see is what's, in essence, peering through the window at us. And again, the concept we have, if I come back to, to poor old George Graham, where the correct term for our, what he termed myth and legend, is called it opaki, opaki waitara. Paki is the term used for story, waitara is wall of the house. So Paki Waitara is a story taken from the wall of the house. So the wall of the house that's referred to here is here. So each of these popo have a particular set of literacies that are sitting there. And again, what I'm fearful of is that the literacies that are here are becoming lost, becoming obscure, and we don't have the sufficient processes in place to ensure the literacy and numeracy that's required to learn and engage in these things is becoming lost. So, a bit of a long-winded discussion to get to, to what I want to talk about, and that's ranga. And again, if you go back to the horizontal and the vertical, again, my, my poor diagram uh, skills, it was simply to show the interweaving of elements as you would see within a, in a, in a mat or a particular kit, it's the interweaving of, of the strands. And again, my use of the word ranga is deliberate. If we look at the first concept, rangatahi, the term that's used to describe someone who's youthful uh, or an adolescent. But again, the, the question we're all confronted with is when are you no longer a youth? When are you no longer an adolescent? Some say it's when you have children. But again, we all know some who have had children who are still children themselves. So the thing is, where, where and you know, where does it begin, where does it end? So my argument here is, rather than it being a linear, you go from adolescent to teenage, then adult, and then probably into the third age, rather than it being a linear process, this here describes a particular state of mind. And again, it's a compound word. Ranga is a strand. Tahi, singular. So what it's describing, it's that singular world view that we all have as we grow. So if I reflect back on my own upbringing within a very rurally isolated part of Te Uruwera, my world view was the world that informed me. If I saw any practice that differed from that world view, I was very quick to point out it was incorrect. So I was holding to my world view, and there's no way I would believe there are other ways of thinking. So when I found out the world wasn't flat, I enter through this term here, which is rangahau, which is the term we use for research. And it's a good, it's a good translation. Again, ranga, strand, ho is new or wind for new. So as I move from my singular world view, and then I begin to understand, actually there are other ways of thinking, there are other points of view, and as I move between those two concepts from quickly discrediting it to thinking, well, actually, maybe there probably are other ways of doing things. And as I move in and out of those, those states of being, I get to the point where at times it's, it's as a result of an epiphany, but I reach a point of profound clarity. And the word that we use for Māori for profound clarity is kwa mātau. The penny has dropped. It's the aha time. So again, the term mātauranga, which is a good use of the term, is to describe knowledge. So in my particular interpretation, the compound word here, mātau, profound clarity, ranga, of other strands and other ideologies. So moving from my particular singular world view, from my rangatahi stage, as I begin to move and I understand that there are other ideologies, there are other points of view that exist, as I move between those two elements, as I mature, I then gain a level of understanding and a level of clarity of my worldview, which is captured in the word 
Matauranga. The last term in this diagram is the use of the word rangatira. And rangatira is the term that's used to describe someone who is a leader. Again, it's a compound word. Ranga, strand, tira is a grouping of people. My interpretation of the term rangatira is the person who can unite all of the different strands of a collective, pull all of the different ideologies together, weave them to create an epistemology that every single person in here can see what part they have, what their contribution is to the collective around them. Is my interpretation of the term rangatira. So, reflecting back on my, my times as a secondary school teacher, and again in the process of learning, as I engaged with my class, we were beginning at the rangatahi stage. I was coming from my particular strand of knowledge, strand of understanding. They were coming from their particular strand of understanding. What we needed to do was go through a process of respecting the other, understanding the other, understanding the point of view the other was coming from. And then once we had done that, we then gain a level of clarity of where the other is coming from. And in doing so, the element of what I was trying to achieve in the classroom, the art of learning and teaching, is the bit that's elevated to mastery or to leadership. And again, the other element I want to make around this, it is a key part of my work is context matters. Because I'm a, rangata, I'm a rangatira in one context, if I'm a master at chewing a horse, doesn't make me a master at being a computer programmer. So again, responding back into the elements from a teaching perspective is that because you're a master in one, depending on what the context is, if you are a newbie to that context, you are back at the rangatahi stage. And that as you begin to engage with that new concept that you're struggling with, most of us get down to probably about understanding it. And unless it's something that we're absolutely passionate about, we'll get to the point of actually mastering it, being a master of it. So again, its context is very, very critical in the work that I, I work in. So just to finish off, again, context is a critical, comp critical component that must be understood in the teaching and learning environment. By drawing the connection between learner and content, what is being delivered becomes relevant. Supporting the notion presented by Maslow way back in the 40s, by creating the relevant connections, students are able to see they belong and will subsequently feel safe and secure, motivating them to achieve. It's not the answer, but it is one of the things that will go a wee way to addressing some of the underdevelopment that exists in our schools. The ability to maintain a connection to space and place for Māori becomes increasingly more important as we begin to engage with different forms and formations of Māori knowledge. Knowledge we have inherited, social construction that occurs in connecting the old to the new. Through mapping out the sequential order of events through whakapapa, it provides us the intent that exists within our practices. And again, the change is not the, it's not the enemy, it's knowing what you're changing. If we don't understand the need to locate the learner and content as being a key component in the politics of knowledge, then Māori learners are in danger of reproaching mutant forms of language, knowledge, and therefore disconnected from a more iwi authentic base. If this is to be the case, then the danger is that a less authentic language, knowledge, and cultural base is a likely outcome. And while this might be useful in the short term, it will lack the epistemological rigour and social bias to, to be sustainable over the long term. And the last point, this precarious, short-sighted approach will also destabilise the societal structures of the Māori community, resource and cultural practice, which in turn are dialectically relational to the survival of language and knowledge. We cannot have the language without the culture. Kia ora tata.
like it's the last day, so it's not running. <laughs> one down here. Got my left. One down the back. Kira Wurumu, Keita. Oh, kia ora. Kira brother. Hey, here. I he he rua ngā pātai. Hi. Ah, ko te pātai tu tahi. I asked a question on Sunday at the Pohiri to our mate uh, Rangima, and uh, he part and he said he need to talk to the pātai ki ia. So it's a similar question to you. So the first question is uh, PSGEs, so post-government settlement entities. Mm -hmm. So my question was to her, um, where is Ngāti Whātua pertaining to post-government settlement entities? And same, the question is to you about Tūhoi, Tūhoi Tanga, and your post-government settlement entity. A lot of the government entities are designed on the Western model, mm -hmm. on that, that top one. Uh, Takupatai to you, Wurubu, is how do you incorporate te, te wākainga, te iwi kainga, into that Western model? Gilda, I, I think the challenge is, is the, the, the book is, particularly for us from Tuhui, as we as we're engaging on our own particular post-settlement process, the book that always resonates in my mind is that of Animal Farm. We, we need to be careful we do not then take on the role of the pigs within that particular book where we then simply replace one selected few making decisions on our behalf for another selected few. And the challenge that we have is, as, as Tuhe and I guess it, and as, as Māori is a lot of our practices that we have around our tikanga and our kawa, it is about ensuring that our environment, the processes we engage in, are safe to hand on to the next generation. What's been introduced into that environment is a very heavy and clearly fiscal element that we require now as we move on to the next generation and the decisions we make for our mokopuna and our tamariki Part of the, the environment that we hand on to them is one of, of the fiscal requirements. So in keeping in the, the central thought of what we hand on to our next generation, we try and leave it in a better form that we received it in. So taking that particular concept as we hand on the fiscal elements to our next generation, it's making sure we leave it in a better state than what we uh, received it in. So the key part of that where we have a whole lot of models where people are very quick to point out uh, the failures within our, our tribal structures that include money, the challenge is how do we engage the use of the financial elements and maintain our, whether it's hauitsi tanga, ngāti porautanga, uh, whether it's our tūhoi tanga, and we don't simply become a, a Māori business that just by accident happened to be Māori. And I think that's the challenge as we move forward, is uh, how do we maintain that? Now, for our particular area within, within Tuhoi, it's making sure that the voice that drives the decision-making is from the collective. So all of the pathways into people onto our particular te matua have to be supported and come from the collective. So it's the marae, it's the hapu, it's the collective which then inform what goes up onto those boards. Because we come from a very clear world that is all around the individual. So everything that we do is around what do I gain as an individual out of this particular settlement. So it's how do we reverse that, and I think that's the challenge for us. I asked uh, Mai Ching the other day about the two laws. And as a good lawyer, she did a very cool sidestep <laughs> and shot off to score the goal. Um, so takupato to you is, um, I spoke about the LAW law yep. and Kate Mohiwea. Mm. She was pretty good on it. She was pretty hot, actually. I, then ex I said then to her, can she explain to our librarians here the LA LORE law that you and I are, we, uh, as, to us, it's not a subset of LAW. Mm -hmm. It is clearly of the same equal standing. Mm -hmm. 
and you've given some examples there. What I would, what I'm hoping to is, is to elaborate to our librarians um, some examples of L O R E law. Copy. And I think you know, to me, I <laughs> um, need to make sure my chair of council is not sitting in the room. <laughs> um, I'm I'm kind of a similar thing. To me, I don't differentiate between law, L-O-R-E, and L-A-W. To me, the law that we have, which is tikanga, is our law. And again, if we, if we look at the term tikanga, it simply means to be truthful. It simply means to act truthfully, to be honourable, and to be true in your intentions and your intent. And so as we begin to peel through the layers within there, we have practices and processes that ensure that we are true and we are honest to each other. And part of that honest and that truthfulness has come through our, our whakapapa, the sequential order of events that have created the situations we find ourselves in today. So we don't simply change things out of the fact of not knowing what we're changing. If we ch simply change things without understanding the full impact and the full, uh, I guess, range of issues and elements and points of reference that created the situation we're in today, we're moving into some very uh, uncertain uh, waters going forward because for Te Māori, our worldview is, is, is different. We literally walk backwards into our future. I describe my past as the days that hang in front of me, i ngā rā o mua. So through whakapapa, through the sequential order of events, I am able to map the decisions I'm about to make. The story I shared around Rangi and Papa, each and every one of us in this room would have, would have either been tu matawinga, tāwhiri mātea, and the majority of us would have been tāne. In the sense, some of you would not have wanted to have left home. I've still got siblings who are still at home. Goodness me, they're in their 40s. Okay, that's tāwhiri mātea. Okay, will not leave home. Some of you can't wait to get the hang out of there. Tu matawinga. But the majority of us know to grow and to continue our growth and development, we must leave home. And that's manifested through tāne. So again, through our sequential order of events, it lays the context and the truth which governs our world view by. I don't know whether I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Another good sidestep. Ketupai, <laughs> <laughs> ketupai. I'll ask over here. Kia ora, Wiramu, uh, Claire, Claire Gabriel from AT University. Um, my question for you, if I may ask it, is uh, if I understood your talk rightly, you referred to differences between Indigenous and non-Indigenous knowledge, values, principles, frameworks. But have you ever found that there are also areas of shared ground and common understanding between the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous, given that the non-Indigenous um, in Aotearoa can often be quite diverse in itself? I hope that's not a silly question. No, 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 it's not. Um, shared understandings? I, th I think my... Uh, I think my argument is, is built on there are a different set of values and principles which inform our thinking. The, the other term I, I, I didn't touch on in the presentation was we have a term within Māori which is called tūranga waiwai. Tūranga waiwai is, is tūranga, standing, waiwai, your place where you stand. It is your special place that each and every one in this room have uh, where we go back to either to, you know, to recharge our batteries, uh, whether it's home, whether it's where we've got family members. So there's a particular space and place that we refer to. My interpretation is tūranga waiwai also has a cognitive element to it. It is... <coughs> Excuse me. That cognitive element is that it's that space and place you refer to when you're challenged, where you're feeling uncomfortable, and there are a set of parameters which help inform your thinking. In informing your thinking, it also helps establish what are the things that you're willi willing to negotiate and what are the elements you're not willing to compromise on. So that tūranga waiwai, or those particular elements, help inform our thinking as to what you know, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm willing to go along with that. Yeah, okay, it's a slightly different view to me, but however, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. To the other extreme is where, you know, sorry, I, I totally disagree. So I think rather than looking at what are the common areas of understanding, mine is looking at we come from a different point of view, 
And I think the key thing is the different is okay. Uh, we're not trying to, to homogenize us and think, you know, we all must simply think and act and be the same. Is that what, what, what I'm arguing here is that there is a diverseness amongst us which needs to be celebrated. Rather than homogenizing us and thinking that we all must think and act and be, it's to allow us, and again, taking on some of the, uh, uh, some of Descartes' views that there are multiple truths, there are multiple world views out there around some of the, the notions of postmodernism. So we don't have to find the truth. And in finding the truth, we have to discredit every other version and every other story that's out there. Rather than celebrating the fact that there are multiple truths out there. Thank you. Here and then we'll go over there. Oh, okay, we're going to go back to Frank. Okay. Kia ora, Wiramu. Uh, I'm Claire from Otatahi, Christchurch. In Christchurch, many of the institutions have very strong links to Kaitahu. Um, and I want to ask is it enough, do you think, for us to be aware of uh, diversity within Mataranga Māori? or do we need to take it further and make it official in our policies and, and things like that? Kia ora, Claire. Pai tō pātai. Um, can I be as bold as to say, no, it's not enough? Uh, I think uh, wonderful that you, you recognise uh, kaitahu, uh, but in recognising them, there is a particular relationship that is unique to them. And I think the key part is working alongside them as they then help unfold the relationship and how they actually want it managed. Because there is a knowledge system that permeates every single part of the South Island that belongs to Kaitahu. Some of it is widely seen, lots of it will not be. And I think the, uh, my fear is if we don't collectively, all of us, understand that there are other literacies, there are other elements out in our environments that we work in, if we aren't aware of them, then it becomes increasingly more difficult to make them accessible to the public in New Zealand. Uh, and as long as that, that accessibility to the elements of kaitahu is managed and operated by kaitahu, which then begins to shape the relationship you have with them. Thank Jordan. Uh, kia ora, Atamari e Viru uh, Being a migrant here, there were quite a few words of Maori that I did not understand. And I thank you very much for today's presentation because I've come across the words and I've gained an understanding of that. Thank you. Thank you. More than happy to run through the translation of them after you. And apologies again if, if there were a few too many Maori terms. Uh, thank you very much for your very deep presentation of um, spiritual realities, spiritual realities which maybe many of us were unaware of or perhaps had limited knowledge of. My question is really just simply as, as a Pākehā, as a European, um, under the Treaty of Waitangi of course we have a partnership, we have a bicultural partnership mm -hmm. and that therefore implies a covenant, a, a, a commitment to coexistence. Um, and what your presentations brought out this morning, uh, although you didn't really explicitly say it, is that traditional knowledge, Maori knowledge, has been losing a battle against European knowledge for the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, how can European knowledge continue, perhaps, to? It, what, is the, what is the basis of that relationship? How does it continue to coexist? Like, one of the things that came out, you said earlier, was, um, you know, the inbuilt, I think, um, colonialism in New Zealand education system. So I just wondered whether you feel there's anything good at all in the education system in New Zealand fr from a generic knowledge context, which, which sometimes we, you know, tend to think that... Um, of course, there was an assumption that the all European knowledge was superior in the 19th century, and you've, you've really proven that. But uh, how do you see that 
generic knowledge continuing to coexist with Maori knowledge? That's really what my question is. Yeah. Thank you. One wonderful question. Um, I guess to me, uh, the the challenge we have is my reference back to you know most of us in the room we're educated in in mainstream schooling in New Zealand. If we were to if we were to take a critical theory look at what's at play there and ask the simple question, someone somewhere is is deciding what counts as knowledge in our schooling system. And then we analyse who is that what and who is that who somewhere. And then we have a look at what is the tūranga wai wai, what is the, the cognitive space that they're drawing their understanding and their knowledge from. And then in doing that, we very quickly see that it's not coming from a non maori space and place. And you're absolutely right, within New Zealand we have that, uh, that relationship that is defined by the treaty, which implies that there's equity in how we actually run and operate things. And that implication also implies there has to be an equal space and point of view given for elements of Māori that I've touched on briefly, briefly this morning to be included as elements into our main core curriculum in New Zealand. At the moment we still quite haven't uh, got that balance quite right yet. And I think the key thing is that if we know and we understand the politics that are at play, it helps us quickly get to a point where we can engage and we can create an environment that allows our students in New Zealand to grow with a balanced world view of New Zealand. See, to me, all of the elements that I've touched on here today, none of them have come from my four more years of schooling, all the way through to doctoral level. All of the elements I've touched on here were drawn from my lived reality as a person growing up in my environment. Interestingly, I, person I went to secondary school with, we. Uh, as most young men in New Zealand do, is you wind up playing rugby and getting into all sorts of different teams. You wind up living with each other. We went through our, our high school years, uh, stage one university together, um, and then a few months later he saw me on Te Karere speaking Māori. Saw me a couple of weeks later, and the question that he put to me absolutely floored and astounded me. His question to me was, when did you learn how to speak Māori? And yet, in his whole world view, he wasn't aware that I didn't learn English until I arrived at primary school. So again, the whole system was built and geared for looking at one set of knowledge. And in doing so, it ignored everything else out there that was Māori. So again, the challenge that we've been pushing within the education system in New Zealand is that for me as a Māori arriving at school, who I was as tūhoi was left at the gate. It didn't even get into the classroom, let alone get into the curriculum. So, you know, I, in, in my academic career, I've been to England on a number of occasions. A uh, guy who's, who's still working at uh, MIT at the moment, Stuart Middleton, after one of my trips back from England, said to me, how did you find uh, London? I said, oh, look, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, and, and, and I, I was searching for the word, and he said, was it familiar? And I said, absolutely. And again, the education system we had in New Zealand prepared us for London, not New Zealand. <laughs> so again, you know, some of my colleagues that I've gone through with some of the stuff we do in university are absolutely frustrated and angry. When we begin to go through the layers of history that is New Zealand, the frustration they have is why are we not taught this in our secondary school system, in our formal uh, processes within the education system in New Zealand. And I mean, you know, there are some hard truths that need to be told around New Zealand. You know, people need to understand the elements of genocide that are around the world, our earlier governments in this country tried to do that. Uh, through the settlements of my particular tribe of Tuhoi, we were one of the few places in New Zealand where genocide was tried on us as Tuhoi, and it was couched as a scorched earth policy. So all of these things as our whakapapa, as the sequential order of events that have helped inform my present and how we move together as a past, how we move together as a past is by acknowledging them. Some of it's done by, by the Pātai in the back there around how we actually firstly understand that there are issues that need to be resolved. That's where the treaty settlement bit comes in. But then the key part for us with this Māori is the real work begins when the settlement has arrived. Not, this, not attaining the settlement, it's actually what do we now do now that we've actually got the settlement? How do we then move forward as an iwi? 
And those are some of the things that we as Tuhoi are, are doing. Um, unfortunately, some of the things in our local paper in Whakatane is uh, we're being challenged around how people now need to apply to Tuhoi for hunting permits. Um, but I think, you know, I thank you for your question, and I think the, the key point, how do we engage it and how do we get it to exist along uh, the generic knowledge system, I think it's by having the conversation. Uh, it's having the conversation and allowing the curriculum in New Zealand to understand there are Māori points of view, there are Māori positions that are required in our mainstream schooling. Don't abrogate the responsibility to kura kaupapa, to whare kura, which it tends to be a wee bit easy to do that. It's that every student in this country has a, a, a pathway through formal learning, and that formal learning, what is its responsibility as Māori to our students within New Zealand? And I think that's the challenge that we, we need to, to work towards. Kia ora. We have time for one last question, if there is one. Oh, okay. Okay, two. <laughs> go DJ and then we'll go down the back. I'm not an MC and I'm not a kaikariki, I'm a librarian asking a question. <laughs> 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 I love that kōrero uh, it was absolutely beautiful, um, really um, well detailed, really intricate. Um, like looking at a beautiful kōrowai um, as it's laid out in front of us. My question, and I think like you've almost answered it already, uh, many, uh, some of us academic librarians, oops, uh, some of the academic librarians catalogue the PBRF, uh, and when the Māori ones come in, uh, they get put under, oh, that's just post-colonial discourse, put that under there, that's enough. <laughs> uh, or, you know, oh, it's still contributing to postmodernism, that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm. So it's not really treated yep. on its own merit and on its own accord. And I had a problem with that when I was cataloguing PBRFs mm. too, but, I, you know, you had to suck it up and just do the work. <laughs> um, so I, I think what I'd like to hear is a visionary statement about how we get to move past that um, living in that Kapai. dependency and, uh, within that always just purely being known as people contributing to post-colonial research rather than um, us trying to institute and establish our own um, philosophy um, and standing separate and on its own. Kapai. Kia ora. Tēnā koe mō te pātai. I think the, to, to answer the question, I think from my perspective, colonisation hasn't gone away. Colonisation exists, it, it's, it's one of those things where it just simply re-images itself. And if we have a look at what's, what's funded and what's deemed as real knowledge in New Zealand, and if I link what's real knowledge to what's funded, is if it doesn't belong to STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths, you've got a very difficult job to find and secure funding for it. So there's a hierarchy of knowledge at the bottom of it are the cultural elements which a lot of our stuff tends to be marginalised and linked into. So one of the, the pieces of work we've been working on is how do we reverse that hierarchy and simply mātauranga Māori needs to exist on its own and through mātauranga Māori, as I tried to demonstrate this morning, is a very deep epistemological link to all forms of knowledge. Māori were scientists. They're indigenous ways of, of knowing sciences. Uh, but the thing is, it's the terminology, the terms, the language we use. Because it doesn't fit into the positive way of thinking, again, and the argument again is positivism is the true knowledge. And the irony of it is I almost, I, through this presentation, uh, fell into one of the very arguments we argue against, where through positivism, they can simply uh, describe, reduce, your whole world view into a di into diagrammatic form, which is what I've done through the through the presentation. But however, in you know reducing some very complex epistemological points of view down into some rudimentary cartoon form uh, as a way of actually helping explain is okay. But as long as it is not taken as a way of uh, of owning it, I now understand that I can put it into that particular box, tick the box, and I now understand it. So again, part of the challenge that we have is we will not define what is mātauranga Māori. The definition of mātauranga Māori comes from te ao Māori. 
So different tribal groups will define it in their particular way. So we have a bit of a challenge at the moment with the New Zealand Qualifications Authority, whose role is to quality assure our, our work. They need to be able to show us what does good look like. And the challenge they have with Matauranga Māori is where we've got them to the point of saying, you don't own that. Your part is to show us what does good look like. So the challenge for them is how do they then show this nebulous moving element of what does good look like. So part of it means it's the relationship back here as it's beginning to begin with kaitahu. It requires a partnership so that we're able to co-construct what it is we're trying to do. So the key part around the PBRF and what counts as knowledge is one of the challenges that we have is to ensure the bits that we do within te ao Māori are not of lesser value than those that are not. Because the whole PBRF, the performance-based research funding element, is around that. Because you have a look on who gets funded, top 10 universities. So in essence, the 97% of the PBRF fund has gone to the top uh, 10 universities. And then everyone else has to squabble over the less than 3% that's in there. So the irony of it is, a lot of the research that comes out of these main CRIs and universities those that are Māori, and again, this is a challenge for us as Māori, is know what we're doing when we engage to participate in these researches as an advisor, as someone who is going to direct and guide them, because with us advising and guiding them, we are giving them the credibility to have access into the areas where we no longer are comfortable with being researched. We will do the research. We do not want to be researched from that point of view that Someone somewhere is deciding what counts as knowledge. Uh, so again, thank you for the question, and I think there, there is more work to do as we begin to unfold and develop the, I guess, the, the multiple layers of indigenous knowledge that exists within New Zealand. And New Zealand, I, I think, is one of the, is leading the world in what we're doing here. Uh, I spend quite a bit of time in, in the US working with First Nations, uh, and within New Zealand, we are by far on that cusp of leading this development through. Long way to go yet, but we're a wee bit away ahead of everyone else in the world. And our final question. Kia ora. Um, Kia ora. I'm Craig Murray from Te Whare Wananga Awaraki. Ah, and um, my question is, is two parts. You were talking about the literacies around the, the PO and, and how you fear that they're going to be lost. How can we as librarians help you um, maintain those literacies and, and promulgate those literacies? And the second part is, if that um, transition is in a digital na nature, does those literacies lose impact in a digital world? Okay. Kapai, thank you. I'll start with the last question first in case I forget it. Those of you who get the opportunity to come to Whakatane, uh, there is a marae that's been relocated there called the Manuka Tutahi, has an interesting history, uh, where you will find a very nice relationship between modern and old. So on the back wall of that particular whare they have this wonderful laser display, which tells of the history of that particular area. So our, our traditional normal whakairo, you will see through the different laser light, the whole room gets darkened, and then the lights come onto the whakairo where the eyes then begin to blink. So by just using and manipulating light, they're helping to tell the stories that sit along those walls, those paki waitara. So, and then again, the different way the light things, it, it's almost, it brings these whakairo to life. By just the way the light moves and the use, use of uh, data projectors. Uh, wonderful and fantastic, and if you get the opportunity to, well worth the visit. The other bit is your role within the library structure. You're absolutely right. For me, the fear is the literacies that exist in our whare nui, whether it's within the library, whether it's in our education system, are fast becoming lost. See, again, if you have a look on most, and I mean just one, one example, if you have a look on most whakairo, uh, at times you'll see a lizard either coming out of the person's mouth, sitting on the tongue, sitting on the chest, sitting on the shoulder, but normally it's around the mouth. And again, 
The element that has been portrayed there, it's to remind us to be very careful with the words that we choose in our everyday conversation. Because within Te Ao Māori, once the word is said, it is done. Saying sorry does not remove what you have done. And again, the lizard, it's a ngārara, it's an element to remind us that our words can be sent to hurt, and they also can be sent to heal. And again, it's that similar concept. But the key point that's there to remind us is to be very careful about how we use the language we are using. Because once the word is out, it is there. You cannot undo what you have said. And again, it's some of the responsibilities that we, uh, as we begin to move through the different layers within our communities that we work in, and as those who then become, uh, become the speakers for the hapu, the whānau, the marae, the iwi, are the elements they're very, very mindful of. So one of the things that uh, you do not want to do unwittingly, <laughs> unless you, you're, you're planning on doing it, is upset someone. Um, so again, the challenge that we have in our, in our libraries, not only in our libraries, in our whole education system in New Zealand, is to understand there are multiple literacies out there. If we look in our environment, and again, I was trying to provide some examples here by the, the, the wealth of knowledge that sits under some very common or thankfully uh, quite frequently used Māori terms now in, in everyday use. There is a whole knowledge system that sits under those terms. So as we begin to move and into engaging more in the Māori space, it's welcoming and inviting people to then begin the journey of, of, of doing that thing that research requires us to do, have another look, re-look at what you've looked at, and challenge the assumptions that you think you understand that are there. So, and you know, I again, welcome you within the library context to, you know, as much as you can, make these places firstly aware that there are other literacies out there, again, and that can be managed through engaging in the iwi relationships with uh, the local iwi hapu that uh, operate in your particular area. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these histories are held orally, uh, and again, the, a large number of the histories that are written at times are coming from that generic knowledge view they're written through a set of lens uh, built for a world uh, that was different to what they're trying to understand. And if you look at some of the early histories around Tsuhoi, Elsden Best, uh, even though he was uh, one of his key informants raised my granduncle, um, again, Elsden Best came at it from his particular world view. And all the way through, his language is guarded around, it's, it's, it's heavily weighted on value judgments from his particular position. So it's how we rewrite those stories to then present them as to what is actually existing within Te Ao Māori. So uh, welcome the opportunity to work with you. Also welcome uh, for you within the library sector to engage your iwi and hapu in the areas that you're located in to actually help you build those relationships, build the understanding and build the access uh, for the students who walk through your doors.